you mentioned that there is a bunch of reasons why those numbers can go up. How would you summarize what those main reasons are that would drive the, the blood pressure numbers up? So years ago, we used to say, after all the work that was done, that hypertension is the geneticist's graveyard for their reputation. You would think that something as important as high blood pressure, at the current time, it's at the top of the World Health Organization's list of things that prematurely kill people or damage them so that they live with something called a disability-adjusted life year, or a DALI for short. So heredity, you would think heredity would play a big role. About 30 to 40 percent of hypertension we can map to family history or genes, and no single gene by and large. Rare cases of single genes, sure, and they're almost always centered about how the body handles salt. But by and large, most people do not have a single gene defect. Otherwise, we could try and fix it at some point that elevates their blood pressure. So part of it's heredity, but it's not the majority. Second thing is that we have what we call exposures over time. The Framingham study showed in the 1960s that the biggest predictor that you could measure for having hypertension later in life was how much you weighed when you were a teenager and a young adult. So people that were heavier were more likely to develop hypertension over time. And right now, that's still probably one of the biggest factors that plays a role in blood pressure elevation is body mass, body mass index, however you measure it, whether you use the body mass index, you know, kilograms per meter squared kind of thing, or whether you use a measure of waist circumference and height, doesn't matter. You can tell fat. Fat people are then they'd be fat. People that are kind of big but really muscular, they look a little different. So body weight is an important component. Some portion of the world, we don't really know the exact amount, but some portion of the world, when they eat more salt, their blood pressure is higher. When they eat less salt, their blood pressure is lower. I wish I could tell you what those numbers are. The problem with the whole salt literature in my opinion, is that we still don't have a definition of what salt-sensitive hypertension is. How many millimeters change does there have to be in the numbers on how much milliequivalents or milligrams of sodium that equals a salt-sensitive hypertensive? And there's numbers 3, 5, 10, all sorts of things bandied about out there. So we still have a little bit of definitional problem there. But most people agree that salt intake is another aspect that raises blood pressure. The circulation likes to be exercised. So the ability to adapt to needs, especially skeletal muscle needs, which is a huge area where blood can go. When you exercise your cardiac output, how much blood your beat, heart beats per minute, that can increase four to six fold in some people. And it's all going to skeletal muscle and it's going there to rinse away the products of skeletal muscle activity like lactic acid and carbon dioxide and other things. And it does that in an amazing degree. So physical activity is one of the things that you often find in guidelines as a means to help not only defray the likelihood of developing high blood pressure in the future, but also as a component of the lifestyle approach to managing blood pressure currently. And lastly, Simon, there's a whole sidebar of things that we think are important. Potassium deficiency, for example. Most of our American diet, for example, is really high in sodium and really low in potassium. And some people would say it's not the sodium alone, it's the ratio of sodium to potassium that we get in our diet that tends to be the bad thing. So if we elevated the potassium and kept eating our Lay's potato chips, etc., we could probably undo some of the sodium low, but I'm not recommending that as a therapy for <laughs> managing blood pressure. Last Lastly, and the current ACCAHA guidelines have come out in print about this, there is a role for alcohol, but boy, is it, in my mind, terribly hard to distinguish or to tease out what exactly its role in blood pressure is. I want to step through some of those things a little more, sodium and, and physical physical activity. But before before we get there, I appreciate that you were mostly going through things that are modifiable some of the exposures that we can change through our lifestyle choices or modify over time. But in terms of the non-modifiable, if we think about age and sex, is, high, is hypertension or high blood pressure something that affects 
men over the age of 40 more than others? Is there differences between you know, races? How would you summarize that? So there are, fortunately or unfortunately, the U.S. is such a mix of Hispanic, Black American, White American, and now growing portion of Asian and South Asian individuals, that there is a difference, men versus women. Women tend to have less because of hormonal protection until menopause, and then they surpass men. Black patients, Black Americans, tend to have more hypertension compared to white. Not a lot. I mean, this isn't like 20% versus 5%. It's like 58% versus 53%. There is always a difference, and it always, unfortunately, penalizes minority populations. That said, Hispanics, for example, have more blood pressure, but often less consequences compared to that same level of blood pressure in a white population for example. So age. Age affects the upper number throughout the lifespan in the U.S. Age does not affect the diastolic pressure the same way. When you look at what happens to the lower number over time, it peaks during your 50 to 55 year age bracket. Then after 55 or so, it falls. So systolic continues to rise diastolic falls after 55. That means that the pulse pressure, the difference between the upper and the lower number, widens as you age. And one of the things we think explains that is a change in the pattern that elevates blood pressure. When you're younger, the resistance to blood flow, so how much you have to push in order to get that two and a half ounces out into the circulation, the diastolic pressure especially tells you that it's a resistance-related thing. The body is just fighting you in terms of every heartbeat. But as you age, we learn this from the airline industry. When you take a wing and you do this to it like 10,000 times a day for like a period of months or so, much like flying an aircraft, certain stress fractures occur in the wing itself. And the same kind of stress fractures occur in the lining, in the wall of the blood vessels. You have these elastin components, especially in the aorta. And as you stretch, release, stretch, release repeatedly, those elastin fragments bust tiny bit each time, but that's cumulative because you don't repair elastin after you finish puberty. You got all the elastin you're going to have by the time you're like 15. And so you got to take care of that. And if you don't and you use it up, the body replaces that damaged elastin with a thing called collagen. If you've ever had a steak or some piece of meat that has that gristle component there, which is really hard and tough, that's collagen. And if you think about what happens when that begins to accumulate in your blood vessels, it makes them really hard to blow up with the beat. And that's why the systolic pressure gets more and more difficult over time. The nature of pressure shifts from the resistance to the stiffness. And the stiffness is what drives the upper number up and the lower number down after 55. We, we don't know if that's truly modifiable or not. Clearly, age is not so modifiable. Gender is not so modifiable. Parental history is not so modifiable. Those are the main factors that have a role in blood pressure that we can't fix. The others we can treat to one degree or another. I recently ran my full labs through Function Health. And I have to say the results were eye-opening. Turns out my ApoB was higher than ideal, probably thanks to a little too much coconut yogurt. I also found out I was slightly low in copper, something that I would have never suspected without testing. On the flip side, my biological age came back 13.3 years younger than my actual age, a calculation based on the work of aging researcher, Dr. Morgan Levine. So all in all, I've got a few tweaks to make to optimize my lipids and nutrient status, but overall my blood work says I'm doing pretty well. That's what I love about function. You get access to over 160 biomarkers covering everything from hormones and inflammation to nutrients, toxins, cardiovascular risk, and more. And all your results are housed in one beautiful platform, all tracked over time. Once you get your results, you can make informed changes before small issues become big ones. To get started, head to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill. The first 1,000 people get a $100 credit toward their membership. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.